Chapter 70 Adventurers Guild You are listening at NovelFull.audio Aizen and Bree stepped through the doors of the Adventurers Guild and looked around. There were three counters on the wall opposite to the door, two out of which seemed to be currently closed. On the left wall was a large pinboard that was completely covered in different pieces of paper, while there was a small area to sit down on the right. Currently, there wasn't much traffic inside of this building, and only two young men and a woman, who Aizen guessed to be new adventurers judging from their equipment, were currently standing in front of the pinboard. At the one open counter, another young woman was seated, staring into the open space in front of her due to boredom. However, when she saw Aizen and Bree, together with seemingly two different beasts, suddenly enter, her face turned bright and happy to make a good impression on the customers. Today, Aizen was wearing his fine suit, as he had neither in set plans for combat nor crafting and instead wanted to finally wear his casual outfit, which he didn't have the chance to really do ever since he made it. Another reason why he wore this was to hopefully make a good impression, and since it gave a bonus to his charisma, it would also help just that tiny bit more in convincing the staff to give him the information he wanted. Aizen stepped in front of the desk with a bright smile and simply asked away. Good morning, young miss. If possible, I would like to get your help with something. He said, and the woman with short blonde hair and light skin smiled professionally while nodding her head. That's what we're here for, sir. And what is it that you want us to help with? She asked and lightly tilted her head to the side. Here, I found this not too long ago, and I would like to see it return to its owner. Eisen explained and placed the small metal dog tag onto the counter. The employee took the tag and looked at it closely, before looking at Eisen in slight surprise. Where did you find this? There aren't many rank 4 adventurers around Melro. It just caught my eye in the mountains outside of town. I showed it to my friend here, and she suggested to find its owner by asking about it here. Ah, uh, I see. Thank you for finding this and bringing it to us then. We will see to have have it returned. The woman said and slightly nodded her head at Aizen, pulling the tag over to herself. But before she was able to completeel dismiss Aizen after this, he laid his hand onto the wooden surface to get the employee's attention. Excuse me but would it be possible for us to bring it back to its owner? Me and my friend were planning to leave Melro soon anyway to travel. Since we don't have a real destination yet, that might be a good place to start. Aizen tried to explain while keeping up mannerisms that might make it easier for the employee to be convinced with the help of his CHA stats and his Casanova title. After all, it seemed like the latter of these would also help in these situations. After a while of simply looking at each other, the female employee simply sighed lowly. I'm afraid that won't be possible, sir. Since for the general transfer of information, we use a special space, magic enchanted item, this will be handled by simply letting other adventurers' guilds know that this has been retrieved and that it cannot be used by others in fraudulent situations. A replacement can be created if the owner of this tag requests it. I see. That's the case then. It's just so that this tag wasn't the only thing I found. Directly next to it was this small diary here. Eisen explained while pulling out a small leather-bound book. It was the one that he found to be in his pocket when he first found himself in the forest near Melro. It seemed like he would have to improvise a bit. I would like to return this to the owner as well. Suspicious at this sudden appearance of a supposed diary, the employee began to frown softly. Then why didn't you mention this diary from the get? Go, sir. She asked straightforwardly, and Eisen looked left and right to make sure nobody was listening before leaning in toward the young woman. You see. I felt quite bad about it myself, but I flipped the diary open to see if there was any information on the owner inside, but all I found were some quite risque contents. Those that one would probably not want to appear in the hands of others, immediately, the woman opened her eyes in surprise while gaining a light blush on her cheeks. Oh dot oh, I see, I see. Berm. Either way, I don't think we can help you much with this. All I can tell you is that this tag was made in the capital of Litgern, Ornier. That is probably the best place to look. 
the employee said at last, prompting some notifications to pop up in front of Aizen. Due to convincing someone to help you with just your words, you have gained plus one CHU, quest updated. Stolen shards, Aizen simply smiled at the first notification and waved it away, and then checked what was apparently changed in the quest description. It really wasn't much, all that was added to the description was that Aizen gained a clue to the position of the adventurers, while the rest of the quest screen stayed the same as before. The old man nodded at the employee and then thanked her for her help, but just before he and Bree could leave, she called out to them again. Ah, sir. Could I ask you a question, if it is not too rude? She asked, and Aizen turned around. Of course, young miss. Ask away. May you also possibly be an adventurer. Considering your build, you seem quite strong. With a low chuckle, Aizen shook his head. No, I'm not an adventurer. I'm a craftsman, so that's why I look like this. I see. Then may you be interested in joining the guild. There is a small examination, but I'm sure you would be able to pass it with ease. She explained while Aizen thought about it for a bit. It probably wouldn't hurt to join, although he would only do this if it wouldn't cut him off from joining the crafter's guild, which he was a lot more interested in than this one. As if already sensing his worries, the employee shook her head. Don't worry, there is no limit to how many guilds you can be a part of. Aizen smiled and walked back up to the counter after asking Bree what her opinion was. She simply told him that it wouldn't hurt to become an adventurer, as it would allow them to make money with simple things like killing monsters or gathering materials if they ever were to run low on resources during their travels. So, Aizen decided to take that test. If that's so, follow me, then. We will first be appraising you for your basic information, meaning stats, skills, titles, level and occupation. The guild employee explained before showing Aizen to a door next to the counters. He stepped through and was then led to another room in the back. The employee brought out a small, fist-dot-like crystal ball, which she then held out to Aizen. Please lay your hand onto this and pour your mana inside. This will at the same time be used to read your mana signature. She explained, and Aizen simply did as told. When the crystal was touched by his mana, it slowly began to emit a soft light, that soon disappeared again. Immediately afterward, the employee brought the crystal ball over to a desk and held it over a piece of paper. It seemed like she also poured her mana inside of the sphere, as the air immediately surrounding it started to shift a slight bit. After that, black lines appeared to be shooting out of the ball to write something onto the piece of paper, which the employee then held up to read through before she opened her eyes wide in surprise. Oh. You have quite a collection of skills there. Although they are quite low ranked for someone your age, you seem to have quite an interesting class as well. And you're already level 71. Yes, you should definitely be able to pass the examination. Since the Adventurer's Guild is focused mainly around combat, it will be a combat examination as well. It seems like you can use both magic as well swordsmanship. Which do you primarily use? Hmm, I guess I focus on swordsmanship, and rather use my magic just every once in a while. Aizen explained, and the employee nodded as she took a note on another piece of paper. She looked up at Aizen and nodded before walking through a corridor that led into a small hall, filled with different weapons and dummies to practice with and on. The employee turned around and looked at Aizen with a soft smile. Now, let's start the combat examination. Aizen, race. Giant, dwarf halfling, occupation. Omni crafts master, level. 71, HP. 1854, MP. 1887, STR. 104, end. 104, AGI. 103, int. 106, wis. 107, Cha. 11, Titles, Casanova, Championos, Original of the Mechanical Arts, Limit Breaker V, Skills, A Dwarf's Hands, Rank. 2, Level. 89, A Giant's Strength, Rank. 2, Level. 
68, Alchemy, Rank. 2, Level. 31, Blacksmithing, Rank. 2, Level. 39, Cooking, Rank. 0, Level. 68, Crafting Space, Rank. 1, Level. 81, Dismembering, Rank. 0, Level. 1, Drawing, Rank. 1, Level. 6, Enchanting, Rank. 2, Level. 11, Flame of the Earth Magic, Rank. 1, Level. 51, Golmancy, Rank. 0, Level. 19, Leatherworking, Rank. 2, Level. 16, Lockpicking, Rank. 0, Level. 1, Mana Copy, Rank. 1, Level. 26, Mana Double, Rank. 2, Level. 46, Mana Manipulation, Rank. 2, Level. 37, Swordsmanship, Rank. 2, Level. 74, Tailoring, Rank. 2, Level. 41, Taming, Rank. 1, Level. 9, Tool Connection, Rank. 1, Level. 61, Truth Seeing Eye, Rank. 0, Level. 26, Woodworking, Rank. 0, Level. 49. Chapter 71 Guild System You are listening at NovelFull.audio The guild employee looked at the piece of paper on which she copied eyes and status information and then walked up to a man that was standing by some of the weapons that were inside of the room. He was built quite tall and had bright red hair, the type that you could usually only have if you dyed it. The man was currently tending to the weapons, polishing them and making sure they were in good condition. He turned around when the employee began to talk. Hey, you need to actually work for once. I want you to test this guy. Here are his stats. She told him. The smile that she showed to Eisen was immediately gone, as if talking to this man was a complete drag. Tisk, sure. Let's see. Oh, what a surprise. His level is quite high. And he's just starting out as an adventurer now. The man asked in surprise, and then looked over to the old man, little girl, golden wolf and mushroom standing by the entrance to the hall. Ah. It's just an old man. Wait, but why are his skills so low then? And his stats are a bit high, aren't they? Not to mention that he even has the charisma stat. He then muttered out, alternating between looking at Eisen and the piece of paper in his hands. The employee frowned in confusion and leaned over to take a closer look again, and after a few seconds of mental calculation, she nodded her head slightly. Yeah. With that level and the bonus stats from ranking up your skills, they shouldn't be this high. Wait, is it that? Isn't Limit Breaker something amazing? I'm pretty sure it is. There are a few people with that title here in town. I heard that it can give you bonus stats as well. Is that so? Well, anyway, get to work you lazy bum. The employee said and grabbed the piece of paper out of the man's hands again. Then get out and let me, will you? He responded with an annoyed voice, but the employee crossed her arms. You know that I have to stay here and watch, so just do it. Fine. But keep quiet for five minutes, will you? The man nearly yelled and the employee returned in front of Eisen with a bright smile. Everything's ready. Now please, if you don't have any weapon with you, take one of ours. The employee explained, since there is quite a level difference between you and that guy, he will only fight with a wooden training weapon so that he can't fatally injure you or destroy your equipment. Eisen nodded with a light smile and turned to Bree, who already grabbed the cloth dot wrapped Zweihander that was sticking out of the top of her backpack. Thanks. Now then, I hope this won't take too long. Aizen said with a smile and stepped forward while unwapping his sword. He knew that it would probably be best to change into his leather armor, but this was simply a test so that the guild would have a general idea, 
and since the man wouldn't be able to cut Aizen's suit apart with a wooden sword, there wouldn't be any damage to it either. Besides, he wanted to go to other guilds later that seemed more business-minded just judging from their names, so he had to make a good impression, so wearing a suit would be the best choice there too, meaning that Aizen would need to change back into it again anyway. He stepped forward and held the sword tightly in both of his hands. The man that Aizen would now be fighting looked at him with eager eyes, grasping his own sword. Come at me whenever you want. He exclaimed, and Aizen began to chuckle in response. Here I come then. Aizen said and jumped forward, slashing his sword down at the man. Instead of jumping to the side as Aizen would have expected, the man simply blocked the attack, which was quite a surprise considering that he did so with a thin wooden blade. Seeing that Aizen didn't have any chance against this man by trying to simply overpower him with brute strength, he shifted his feet around and made his body follow behind in a circular motion and slashed at the man once more, this time from the bottom left side. The man shifted slightly backward and caught the attack to try and take it to his advantage by letting Aizen's blade slide off the smooth wood surface. However, Aizen expected this and twisted his sword just a slight bit to catch the wooden weapon with his Zweihander's parry hook. He moved his sword's tip behind the man in the hope that the hooked wooden sword would be pulled out of his hands, but different to what Aizen expected, or rather hoped, the man was able to simply resist the force that Aizen put on his weapon. Since that was the case, Aizen slid his hooks further up the wooden sword to be as close to its hilt as possible, and then continued twisting and turning his own sword as hard as he could. Now even this incredibly strong man couldn't do anything against this and the wooden sword was pulled out of his hands, landing a few meters away. While the man was jumping back to gain distance now that he lost his sword, Aizen simply attacked once more with a regular slash toward the man's torso. Considering his strength, Aizen was sure that an attack from himself would be fatal to the man, and he was absolutely right. Instead of being hit by the attack straight dot on, the man simply deflected the blade with his bare hands and pushed it down onto the ground with an amount of force that Aizen couldn't even fathom, strong enough to make him lose his grip on the Zweihander so that it fell down onto the ground. All right, that's enough. The female employee yelled out to let both of the fighters know that the examination was over now. Congratulations, sir, you have passed the entrance examination for the Adventurer's Guild. You fought quite well, especially considering that you're a crafter rather than a fighter. Just don't be disheartened by the fact that you lost, Garen may be an idiot, but he's the guild master, so he has to be strong. She explained while smiling happily and completely ignoring the man, Garen, as he was complaining about the treatment the woman was giving him. Aizen didn't really know what it meant to be a guild master, but at the very least it sounded like quite an important position. You can say that again. Not many people can disarm me like that. Garen said with a somewhat smug smile, while the employee continued ignoring him. Well then, sir, if you would please follow me to the front I can explain the basics to you and give you your tag. She smiled and waved Aizen back to the front of the guild. But before then, he turned to Garen and held out his hand. Sorry for not introducing myself before, my name is Aizen. So you are the guild master here? He asked, and Garen nodded. Oh, it's fine. I'm from a larger town, the nicest adventurers there are even ruder than the thugs here in Melro, so you don't need to worry. And yeah, I'm the guild master. There isn't much to do, usually, but every once in a while I can move around a little bit like this. Garen laughed and placed his fists onto his hips while showing his white teeth in a bright smile. There was another thing that Aizen was wondering about, but before he could ask about it, Garen said something that both surprised and confused him, which Garen apparently noticed as well. I just wish my wife Jazz would be a bit nicer to me. Ah, uh, yeah, she doesn't act like we're married, huh? She's a bit shy, huh? Garen laughed and picked up his and Aizen's weapons, handing Aizen his Zweihander before putting the wooden sword back to the other weapons. Aizen chose to simply ignore the matter of the female employee Jazz for now then, since it really was none of his business to pry further. By the way, did you make this weapon? I haven't seen a sword with hooks like that before. 
Garen asked curiously and leaned in to further inspect the finely crafted steel in front of his eyes. Happy that someone wanted to know more about his items, Aizen nodded his head with a soft chuckle. Yes, I made it. It's called a Zweihander, and as you can probably guess, these hooks are meant for parrying. And since the sword itself is quite heavy, it's easier for me to control the other person's weapon than it is for the other person to control my weapon. Aizen simply explained and Garen nodded in response. Huh, interesting. Say, what's your rank at the Crafters Guild? Garen asked curiously, but he didn't expect Aizen's answer. I'm not part of the Crafters Guild yet. I meant to go there to register after finishing my business here. Oh, now that's something unusual. You're a crafter, right? What guild are you part of, then? Actually, I'm not part of any guild at all. Now that is quite a surprise. Most people are part of at least one guild, especially at your age. Garen explained, but Aizen couldn't do anything but smile uncomfortably. I guess I'm a bit of a special case in that regard then. Either way, thank you for going easy on me during the examination. Aizen said with a smile while preparing to end the conversation and making his way to follow Jazz back to the front of the guild building. No no, I couldn't have fought you seriously, that doesn't become of a guild master. And Jazz would have probably started nagging me about it for a week. Well, I'll see you around, and thank you for choosing our guild to be your first. Aizen smiled and nodded before walking back to Bree, Alu and Kuria who were waiting near the door to the hall they were still in, and together they made their way back to the front of the building where Jazz was already waiting. He stepped back around the counter before Jazz placed a small wooden tag onto the counter. This is your identification tag for the Adventurer's Guild. As you can see, we have already marked it with your unique mana signature. I heard you telling Garen that this is the first guild you have joined. Do you need me to explain the basic system? Jazz asked, and of course, Aizen nodded in response. He could have Bree explain it to him, but considering that they were already here talking to a guild employee, it couldn't hurt to have her explain. All right. Basically, we work with a rank system as well. It's the regular 0 to 10 as you should be used to. Every rank has a representation as a material as well. In ascending order, it's wood, clay, porcelain, rock, iron, steel, copper, bronze, gold, platinum and at last crystal. As you may be able to guess, this is also represented in the identification tags. Whenever you rank up your position in the guild, you will gain some new privileges, including but not limited to being able to accept higher ranking quests, accessing certain information, or being allowed to use more of the guild's different services. As a rank zero, you are able to accept only one quest, and once you complete that quest successfully, you will immediately rank up to one. As such, we suggest to get that first quest out of the way as quickly as possible. All you need to do to accept a quest is bring one of the flyers describing quests of your rank over to an available counter, and it will be processed by one of our employees. These quests can be turned in or accepted at any Adventurer's Guild branch. Would you like to accept a quest? Jazz asked with a bright smile and speech that somehow had monotone undertones to it. Of course Aizen wanted to accept a quest right now and complete it as soon as possible, but he was currently just thinking about how the first person that really seemed like a programmed NPC at times was a bureaucratic official. Chapter 72 Crafters Guild You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Aizen grabbed the tag off of the table and was immediately met with a new notification. You have unlocked the guild function, which allows you to access different information in connection to your joined guilds, you have joined the System Guild, Adventurers Guild, after reading through these notification, Aizen smiled and waved them away. Having this kind of function would hopefully be quite useful. Although Aizen wondered about the term, System Guild. Were there other types of guilds than these? Maybe he should ask about that later, but for now it was time to finish the business with taking his first request. Aizen stood in front of the Adventurer Guild's pin board that was covered in a number of different task requests. Most of them were simple requests for gathering different plants, materials, or ingredients, 
while there were also a few requests asking for someone to kill beasts that were roaming around immediately around Melro. There was a small number at the bottom of each piece of paper indicating what rank they were meant for. The majority of the requests were meant for rank 1 and 2, while there were only a handful of rank 3 requests which seemed to be hanging there for a while already. It didn't seem like there was much foot traffic in here, so it made sense to Aizen that most of the requests on this board were still here. While Aizen was looking around, Jazz the guild employee gave him another short explanation. You are allowed to take requests that are up to one rank away from your own. Meaning that, for example, as a rank 3 adventurer you can take up requests of rank 2, 3, and 4. For every request you complete, you will get points, basically the same as experience, and once you get enough points, you are allowed to rank up. How much points you get depends on the request itself, and on top of that, you will gain half the points for completing a quest under your rank, the regular amount for completing a quest of your rank, and twice the points for completing a quest above your rank. I see, thank you. I guess the only request I can accept for now is a gathering request, huh? Then. I'll take that Amran one. Aizen said and reached down to the bottom of the pinboard to pull off the request he wanted to take. The reason why he chose this one was quite simple. It couldn't hurt to know in what kind of surroundings the health dot potion flower Amran grew and what it looked like in the wild so that he would be able to spot it more easily while traveling around, so it would, this one it is. I will process it immediately. The way that this works is to simply hand over your identification tag together with the request, and the information will be transferred to our information center in connection with your mana signature, and can as such be accessed by any adventurer's guild branch. Afterward, you will get the tag back and simply have to hand it back in with the proof of completion. In the case of simply gathering Amran, it's handing in the requested amount. Jazz explained and went through the first part of the process she just described. It only took about a minute before she already handed Aizen the request paper and identification tag once more. You accepted the Adventurer's Guild's Amran Gathering request, I see, thank you for telling me that. I will complete this request soon, then. Aizen said with a smile, before turning around to leave the guild. Thank you, sir. Come back soon. Jazz yelled after him while Aizen and Bree left the building with their non-person companions. The Fey.kin Bree turned to Aizen with a grin. This is the first time I've seen a guild master conduct the entrance test. So cool. What do you want to do now? She asked happily. Aizen didn't know why she was even more excited than usual, but maybe it had to do with him not being there over the past few days, and she was just happy to see him again. He chuckled lowly and looked at the crafters' guild. I wanted to see if I can join some other guilds as well. The most interesting ones to me are the crafters and the merchants' guilds. All right. Let's do that, then. Bree agreed and nodded gleefully. They walked forward and made their way to the entrance of the crafters' guild. Compared to the adventurers' guild, this building was already in far better condition, and a lot more noise was coming from inside. When Aizen opened the door up, he was met with an incredibly busy room. From what Aizen could tell, the layout was mostly the same to the Adventurers Guild, just in a larger scale. The pinboard was larger, the seating area was cut off into its own room, and there were ten different counters instead of only three. Even so, it was nearly completely filled out with numerous people walking around back and forth from and to the pinboard and standing in lines in front of the counters. Aizen first walked over to the pin board to get an idea of what would be done at the crafters guild, and it simply seemed to be requests to have different tools, potions, and all other kinds of items made. Different to the adventurers guild's requests, these went all the way up to rank 7. It was quite simple, and Aizen thought that this was quite a smart way to handle the creation of different tools and items. Since mass production wasn't really possible in this world yet, if a place needed a lot of the same thing made, this would be the easiest solution to get to as many different craftsmen as possible. On top of that, for unknown crafters that just started out, this was a great way to earn money and at the same time get their name out there. Deciding that it would be a good idea to join, 
with a loud sigh, Aizen stepped inside and decided to stand in one of the lines until it was his turn, which would probably take quite a while. Good morning, sir, how can I help you today? A young guild employee asked with a professional smile similar to how Jazz did in the Adventurer's Guild, and Aizen quickly began his business as he was already feeling the impatient stares of other people in the back of his head. Good morning. I would like to join the guild, if possible. He swiftly explained, and the employee nodded in response and waved over a middle-aged dwarven man. I see, then please follow my colleague here, he will guide you through the process. Next, please. Immediately after she explained this, Aizen was already pushed to the side by an impatient man standing behind him. With a sigh, Aizen shook his head at this rude behavior and followed the man that the employee waved over. Good morning. So you want to join the guild? We will first have you appraised, so stand over there, please. The dwarf explained and brought Aizen over to a wall behind the counters before taking a crystal ball like the one used in the Adventurer's Guild. Aizen placed his hand onto the smooth surface once he was prompted to and poured his mana inside, after which the man copied Aizen's status onto a piece of paper. His eyes became big for a second when he looked through it, and then pointed at a door leading to a private room in the back. Follow me, please. He said and opened said door for Aizen and his group. We use these private rooms so no personal information can be leaked during our conversations. We know how much craftsmen worry about secrecy. The dwarf explained in probably the most dialect.free manner that Aizen has ever heard from a dwarf so far. I must say I'm surprised, sir. I haven't heard about Omni Crafts Master yet, but it seems to be quite an extremely high ranking occupation. And considering you have the Limit Breaker title at a stage that I've never seen before, you must be extremely skilled. The admission will as such be no problem, but we will still require one or more items as a reference. Can I ask what your specialization is? Aizen shook his head and smiled at Bree, who quickly placed her bag to the ground so that they could grab a few different items to show Aizen's skill to the dwarf. I don't have a specialization, but as you can see, my highest ranking crafting skills are blacksmithing, tailoring, leatherworking, alchemy and enchanting, so I'm using them the most right now. Although I will begin heightening my woodworking skill soon. Aizen explained and placed a few different items onto the small table in front of them, amongst which were a few mana and health pills, his leather armor, and some of the tools that Aizen made for himself. Other than these items, I also made the suit I am wearing, as well as the wolf standing over there. Just to show you some variety. In surprise bordering on complete shock, the dwarf looked over the items one by one, his gaze stopping on Alu. Erm, you said you made this wolf. I thought you had tamed it. You do have that skill, right? He asked himself and looked over the piece of paper again, and Aizen began to chuckle lowly. No, I didn't tame her. She's an automaton that I created. She has a golem core as her base, and I used a brass skeleton and different gears and tubes to make up her main body. Then I gave her mana crystal sensory organs and muscles, put leather over her, and then added fur made out of brass. If you want I can show you. Aizen suggested, but the dwarf simply shook his head. It's fine, I just used appraisal, and I could confirm that it was you that made it, I mean her. Yeah, this is definitely enough to prove your abilities, definitely. We would usually watch rookie craftsmen while they are creating an item for us to confirm it is really them making it, but seeing how your name is mentioned in the item description, that's not necessary. I must say I'm surprised though, most people without a specialization seem to be simple jack of all trades, but you're a master of them. No discussion about it, sir, welcome to the crafters guild. The dwarf said with a smile and extended his hand which Aizen happily shook. This went a lot more smoothly than it did at the adventurers guild, so Aizen was happy he could make up for the time he had to spend waiting in line. But before we finish up, we would like to ask you for your craftsman signature. It's something that you put on the items you make simply to show that you made them. It won't be protected until you're at least rank 4 in our guild, but after that we will make sure that there will be no fraud committed with your signature pretending to be you. 
Do you have anything like that already? The dwarf asked and got out a piece of paper and a pen. Eisen didn't really think to have long, as it was quite obvious what he would use, as he already put this onto a few of the clothes that he made. He took the pen and quickly drew up the hammer encircled by different patterns as depicted on the coin around his neck onto the paper. All right, we will quickly check to make sure this or something too similar to this hasn't been used before, and then we will get you your identification tag. The dwarf explained and stood up before leading Eisen and the others back out of the room and toward the seating area next to the main entrance. After a few more minutes, the dwarf came back with a wooden tag similar to the one from the adventurer's tag. Here you go, sir. Everything was fine with the crafting signature you chose. Thank you for joining our guild. You have joined the system guild, crafters guild, Eisen looked at the wooden tag in his hands and compared it to the one from the adventurers guild. There was only a small, but noticeable difference. On the front was his mana signature, and on the backside it simply said, crafters guild, in Fien cursive. There was similar writing on his adventurer's tag, but obviously instead saying, Adventurer's Guild. Before Aizen could thank him, the dwarf already pointed over to the pinboard. Do you want to take your first request to get you to rank 1 already? This way I can immediately process it and you don't have to stand in line. I see, then yes, let's do that. Aizen smiled and stood up before walking over to the pinboard to choose his first crafting request. Chapter 73 Potion Barrels You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Eisen looked around the different requests on the pinboard that seemed to be roughly sorted by professions and ranks, which once more seemed like a big difference to the Adventurers Guild, that simply seemed to post whatever request at a place with free space. It would probably be a good idea to choose a request that was quickly completed and would fit together with his goals for the near future. So, Eisen mentally went over those goals once more. A part of what he had been planning for a while now was to start making a few shoes or boots for him, Bree, and of course Korea. But since this could be done in a small space, this should probably wait for after Eisen made the most important part of his plans. The carriage. For that, he would also need some kind of animal to draw it. He was thinking whether or not to make more automatons like Olive for that but since it already took quite a while for a wolf, it would take quite a lot longer for a larger animal like a horse. On the other hand, it would definitely come in handy. After all, if they had something that didn't have to rest that was drawing the carriage, that would be an immense help in saving time. There might also be the possibility that, and Eisen couldn't say this for sure, that an automaton would be stronger and possibly faster than a regular horse, so that was also a plus point. He would also need to prepare quite a large amount of supplies for traveling, and things like dried meats or fruits would be perfect for that, and he might need some more potions as well, which worked perfectly with one of the requests that Eisen found hanging on the wall. He reached up and pulled the piece of paper off the pin board before handing it over to the dwarf standing next to him together with his new crafter's guild tag. All right, sir, I will process this for you right away. The dwarven guild employee said with a smile, quickly rushing behind the wall of counters. It only took another minute until he returned once again. Here you go, sir. The dwarf said with a smile. You accepted the crafters guild's low, grade health potion request, thank you for joining our guild. The dwarf said with a smile after giving Eisen the request sheet and identification tag back. And just like that, Eisen joined his second guild. But just before he wanted to go toward the third guild that interested him, Bree stopped him. Eisen, I don't think we need to go to the merchant's guild. With surprise openly written on his face, Eisen turned to her with an asking smile while scratching his beard. What do you mean? Why not? You see, there are a few different guild types. The ones that these international guilds are usually classified as are either active or passive guilds. Active guilds are for example the adventurers or crafters guilds, since you need to actively get requests and fulfill them to rank up there, but the merchants guild is a passive guild. That means that every trade you make is automatically registered through your guild tag, although I don't know how they do that, and over time you will be able to rank up. 
she carefully explained, not resolving Aizen's confusion, although it was quite useful information. Either way, he would trust in Bree's decision, and as such decided to make his way down the slope they were currently on, and while they started to walk asked his next question. And why shouldn't we go the Merchants Guild then? Can't we sign up like usual? With a smile, Bree nodded and held her hands behind her back while skipping next to Aizen, which seemed quite unreal considering the giant backpack she wore. She really had monstrous strength for such a small girl. Emichem. The Merchants Guild requires you to either have a small reputation in independently selling items of a certain quality, or to have finished an apprenticeship with a merchant already part of the guild, as far as I know. There may be other ways to join, but I'm not really aware of those then. Bree swiftly told Aizen, who nodded in response. I see, that makes sense. Then joining that guild will have to wait for a while. Anyway, I think it would be a good idea to get started with these requests right away. We can just go out to gather Amran, and immediately process it into the health potions. Do you know where they grow? The old man asked and looked at the first of the two requests that he was holding in his hands. MHM, there are a few patches every once in a while in forests, and there are a bunch of areas where a lot of them grow not too far away from town. Bree explained while apparently looking at the information she gathered about the area and saved inside of her database skill before turning to look at Aizen again. I know the way, so should we go now? Yes, let's do that. You have my backpack and a few regular jute bags, right? Let's put the Amran inside of there then. All right, Dot. After deciding on their plan of action for right now, Aizen and Bree made their way to the tunnel immediately leading to the forest outside of Melro. The place where Bree remembered Amran flowers to be wasn't all that far away and it only took about a 20 minute walk. Oh, there are actually quite a lot of them. Do you know how many we can take of these? Aizen asked Bree while starting to pick some of the bright red flowers on the floor in front of him and placing them into a jute bag. Dot, I'm pretty sure we could take all of them. Forests are usually saturated with natural magic, so they should regrow in a day or two. The Fey Dot Kin explained and squatted down onto the ground as well. Shortly after starting to gather the Amran flowers, Aizen grabbed Korea from his shoulder and set her down onto the ground. All right, let's see this as part of a lesson, okay? These are important plants for me and a lot of other people, so we need to pull them out of the ground and take them with us. Do you want to help? Aizen asked her, and the small myconid shook her red cap up and down in a nod before pressing the ends of her arms onto the stem, trying to rip the flower out of the ground with all her might. Come on, girl, you can do it. Aizen cheered her on, which only seemed to pump her up even more, and after a few seconds of pulling with all she had, the stem finally gave in and Korea was now holding her very first self-picked flower. But immediately afterward, she seemed to collapse from exhaustion while hugging the flower tightly. Ha! Huh. So you really have a pure magic focus, huh? Aizen sighed with a smile and placed Korea back onto his shoulder to let her recover, before continuing to gather all the Amran flowers that he could. About an hour later, Aizen and Bree returned to town once more after gathering two jute bags worth of Amran flowers. Deciding that the best spot to work would be Morum's shop, they made their way over there and saw the dwarf, elf halfling sitting at the counter in the front of the store. Ah, uh, Aizen. Nice to see you again. How did that thing you needed the spinning wheel for work out? He asked curiously the moment that he laid eyes on the old man. With a soft chuckle, Aizen walked further into the shop to greet Moram with a proper handshake. Everything worked out quite well. Here, take a look. Aizen said and jerked his head slightly toward the wolf, Lady Automaton standing behind him. Moram looked at Alu with a frown, even walking all around her to see if he could see anything that had to do with magic strings or fabrics, but simply sighed when he couldn't find it. Berm. You used magic string to somehow tame a wolf with golden fur. Huh, no, that's not it. Aizen laughed loudly and slapped Morum's back while he was at it, before simply explaining what Alu really was. 
Of course, he even roughly told him about Aelren and the tests. With his jaw basically glued to the ground, Moram simply stared at Aizen for a while without knowing what to say, until he simply sighed. Aizen, that's... amazing. I really don't know what to say. But Erm. Why are you here right now? Glad that you ask. Basically, I wanted to use some of your tools to make potions, if that's fine with you. Ah, and I saw some large wooden barrels standing in the corner of your workshop, I would like to buy those off of you. Aizen quickly explained, and Moram simply shrugged. I guess that's fine, yeah. I don't really need those anymore anyway. Do you need Amran or Byron as well? Moram asked while leading Aizen to the back and bringing forward two large wooden barrels, and four more smaller wooden barrels around a quarter the size of the large ones. Maybe later, yeah. For now I was planning on making two of these small barrels worth of health potions, plus a little extra for a crafter's guild request. It couldn't hurt to make mana potions either. And I wanted to put the excess water from distilling the potions into the large barrels. I would like to use those for something else I've been thinking about for a while now. Actually, where can I buy these small barrels? They would be good to refill some stuff into. Hmm, usually you could get this kind of stuff at a woodworker's place. I have these because some of my herbs were delivered inside of them, though. Alright, thanks. I might just make some myself, though. Could be cheaper and I would get proficiency in my woodworking skill. Anyway, can I use that table in the corner over there? Aizen asked, and once more, Moram simply shrugged. Sure, go ahead. I'm not too busy today anyway, just finished a new item, so I'm brainstorming a bit. Tell me if you need anything, I'll be in the front. Thanks. Aizen cracked his knuckles and sat down at the table that he asked to use, pouring out the two bags of Amran onto it. The first part of the work was to split off the petals off of the stems. This wasn't really hard, and didn't take long either considering that Bree helped him as well. Thus, they quickly reached the second step. It was time to dry the Amran so that it could be turned into a powder instead of pulping up when Aizen would try to grind it down. Usually, this would take a while, but luckily Bree could use a pretty useful, dry, spell which accelerated it to only take about five minutes. So, this quickly, they had a mountain of freshly dried amaran petals lying in front of them. Next, Aizen got out all of the different tools he would need and grabbed the large containers that Moram had inside of his workshop and began to get to work. First, Aizen ground down some of the petals and poured them into the largest glass flask that he could find before grabbing some of the piles of mana crystals that Aizen owned, which were quickly ground down as well before being added to the amaran powder. And at last, after pouring some water from the self-filling water cup into it, Aizen mixed everything together finely and connected it to the distillation system, the output of which he already connected to one of the large barrels so that he wouldn't need to pour the water inside from a different glass container. After Aizen began to boil the water away, he repeated this process until he had enough health potions to fill out one of the smaller barrels. Chapter 74 Birds, Lizards and Horses You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Small Barrel of Low, Great Health Potion, Quality. Perfect, Rank. 2. Description, A Simple, Small Barrel Filled Out with Low, Great Health Potions Made by the Omni Crafts Master Eisen. The potions are made with Amran. Quantity, 250 potions. Effect, Every potion recovers 300 HP Aizen smiled and nodded at the two barrels and ten regular low, grade health potions that he just prepared, as well as the large barrel nearly filled to the brim with the water that was extracted during distillation. Of course he wouldn't just keep that water with him for no reason, but since he had plans for something that it might help with in the near future, he wanted to keep in sealed up and as clear as possible, which is why he immediately placed the lid on top and hammered it shut with a mallet. Now that he was done with the health potions, Aizen moved on to the mana potions. The process was exactly the same as he had done just now with the health potions, simply replacing the Amran with Byron that Aizen bought directly from Moram. 
So, Eisen ground up the large amounts of Byron and poured the resulting powder into the glass flask together with mana crystal powder and water. Now, after simply mixing this together, Eisen began to boil the water away after hooking up the end of the distillation system to the other large barrel to fill it with the water coming from the mana potion. Eisen repeated this again and again until he had enough potions to fill out the other two smaller barrels with, before nodding in approval and closing the barrels down tightly. After the dot activating his crafting space skill, Eisen brought the barrels to a corner where Moram allowed them to keep the barrels for a few days until Eisen built a carriage to store them in. Alright, that's about it for now. Thanks for letting me work here for a bit again, Moram. Eisen said with a smile, counting the coins in his purse and handing Moram the payment that they agreed on. Of course, don't worry about it. Come here whenever you want. The dwarf, elf halfling explained. After saying their goodbyes for the day, Eisen grabbed the bottled mana potions and intact amaran flowers that he needed to hand in for the guild requests and left the shop everything magic together with his companions. Let's head to the guilds right away so that I can hand the requests in again and get new ones I might be able to finish on the road or something like that. And then let's check out the stables, they are near the inn, right? Eisen asked Bree while they were heading up the slope again, and she nodded in reply. Emichem. Why do you want to go there, though? She asked curiously, and Eisen explained. Oh, I looked inside of there once while walking through town and saw that there were of course animals to draw carriages, and those carriages themselves. I would like some reference and maybe see if I can ask some people about what kind of beast would be best for drawing carriages. Ah. Okay. That makes sense. Bree exclaimed happily. Not too long after this, they reached the crafters guild again, and it was actually a little bit emptier than first thing in the morning, meaning that Eisen would probably only have to stand in line for a few minutes. But before he would hand in his old request, Eisen decided to take a new one to immediately take after reaching rank 1 with that first quest. Since it was possible to take requests one rank above your own, Eisen looked around the pinboard for good rank 1 or 2 requests that seemed interesting enough. It didn't take long until there was one that seemed easy enough to just push in as a break. It was a rank 2 request for a small steel dagger, so it wouldn't take too much work as far as Eisen was concerned. He grabbed the request from the wall and headed over to stand in line. Once it was his turn at the counter, he explained that he was a new member and just finished his first quest to get out of the bottom rank, and placed the request paper, the potions, and his guild tag onto the surface in front of him. All right, sir, we will confirm it right away, it will only take a second. The employee said with a bright smile and looked through the request as described on the sheet of paper, then took the health potions and the tag before walking to a table behind the counter. She was fiddling around with the tag a little bit and closely looked at the potions before coming back to the counter. Congratulations on completing your first request, sir. Here is your old and new tag. From now on, please use the new clay version. Many people like to keep their old tags as a memento, but other than that, it doesn't have a use with our guild anymore. Here is your payment for the request. She explained and Eisen nodded with a smile before taking the copper coins lying on the counter in front of him and placing them into his purse. You have reached rank 1 in the system guild, crafters guild, Eisen glanced over the notification with a smile and then turned back to the employee. Thank you. Can I immediately take this next request? He asked and placed the request for the steel dagger onto the counter. The employee looked over it for a second and nodded with a smile. Of course, sir. I will process it right away. She took the paper and took it a bit behind the counter again together with Eisen's new clay identification tag while he stashed away his old wooden one in his pocket. Only a few seconds later, the employee already returned with Eisen's tag in the request paper, handing it back to him. You accepted the crafters guild's steel dagger request, Eisen thanked the employee and then he and Bree made their way back outside, before immediately walking toward the adventurers guild as well. This time around, there was literally nobody inside beside Jazz who was leaning her head down on one of the counters out of pure boredom. However, when she saw Eisen, 
Bri, Alu and Kuria enter through the door, her head immediately shot up and she looked at them with a smile. Hey there. Didn't expect to see you so soon again. She exclaimed and Aizen responded with a laugh. Just wanted to hand in the Amran for that request I took earlier, and directly take a new request as well. Alright, then you can just give me the Amran and your tag. You can go ahead and choose the next request you want to take. Aizen nodded and did as Jazz explained, walking over to the pinboard after giving her what she needed. He looked over the board and it didn't take long until he really found something that piqued his interest and that seemed to work together well with one of his plans. There was a request to gather a bunch of honey crystals. And it wasn't just artificially crystallized honey, since that would be a request for the crafter's guild more than anything, but it was a natural crystal growing in the center of bee hives. Immediately, Aizen took the request from the wall and brought it over to Jazz, who already prepared the request payment in Aizen's new identification tag. The moment he took the tag, he got the same notification as before that told him that his guild rank increased. Then, he handed Jazz the next request and she went to process it together with Aizen's new tag, and then came back, prompting the correlating notification to pop up, which told him that the request had been accepted. Thanks. Actually, I'm wondering, you said requests can be turned in at any guild branch, right? But if the request for the honey crystals was put up here, it doesn't make any sense if I hand them in at another town. Aizen asked curiously while scratching his beard, and Jazz began to explain the relatively simple process. Ah, uh, you see, items are simply delivered from one guild to the next, so you don't need to worry. This will all be handled behind the scenes, and usually it only takes a few days at most for the items to get to who requested them. She told Aizen, and he nodded in response. I see, then I don't have to worry about that. Aizen said and thanked Jazz for her help, before he and his group made their way back out of the guild. They stepped down the slope and went toward the inn. Now that he thought about it, Juk should definitely be awake by now. Maybe they should check up on him in a bit, but for now, Aizen chose to go to the stable first since it was closer than the inn. The door to the stable was quite large and was currently opened up completely. From inside, Aizen could hear the sounds of different animals and their handlers, as well as general conversations. After stepping inside, Aizen could first see numerous different carts and carriages. A few of them were heavily decorated and seemed to be made mainly for personal transport, while the majority was definitely made to transport goods and large amounts of manpower. Aizen wondered if he could find out more on them now that he would get a close look at carriages around a time where they were still largely used as an important means of transportation, but most of what he could see, he already knew. Either way, this wasn't his main reason to visit here, since that was simply to try and figure out what kind of beast to use for drawing the carriage, and whether or not it would make sense to truly make an automaton, since that would probably take a while in and of itself, time that would probably need to be spent at creating the carriage. Sure, Aizen was a fast worker, but he would probably still need two or three days at the very least to create only the outer shell, so to speak. After that, he would also need to make sure his carriage had whatever he needed inside, like a simple work table for crafting on the road for example. Luckily, he didn't need the help of other people to build it, since the only real help he would need was in holding the structure up while he connected different parts of it together, which was quite easily done with his mana doubles. Aizen walked further into the stable and reached the area where the animals were kept, and could only now see the numerous different beasts that were used. However, there seemed to be three different ones that were most numerous amongst them. A horse, a giant bipedal bird, and some kind of lizard dot like creature running on four legs, that could quite simply be described as a small dragon without wings. Although, Aizen doubted that this creature actually was a variant of dragon, and was rather simply a naturally appearing beast in this world. So far he may have only seen rank zero beasts that existed in real life, but there had to be some that didn't, right? Anyway, to find out more about these three different types of creatures, Aizen walked up to a man that seemed to be working at this stable to ask about them, and the explanation was quite simple. What beasts you would need would depend on what kind of carriage it was pulling. 
Those giant birds, apparently called ferritin, were fast, but not strong, meaning that they were usually drawing personal transportation carriages. The lizards, called Namur, were strong, but not very fast. They were used to draw extraordinarily heavy loads that didn't necessarily need to arrive at their destination within a certain time limit, so they were usually used to transport construction supplies such as wood or metals. The horses on the other hand were quite obviously something in dot between. They were fast, just not as fast as ferritons, and strong, just not as strong as Namur's. They were the creatures usually used by most merchants, especially if they had to transport things that could go bad like produce. So, to Eisen, it seemed to make sense to choose a horse as an animal to draw their carriage. Now, the only choice to make in this regard was to truly figure out if he wanted a living horse, or if he wanted to make one himself. Chapter 75 Assistance You are listening at NovelFull.audio after thinking about it for a while, Eisen sighed loudly. It was obvious what he was going to do, wasn't it? Of course he would make a horse automaton. He just had to. But now there was a problem. He could create Alu in such a highly dot-detailed way only because he had the bones of a wolf to use as reference. Maybe he would be able to copy it with mana copy, but it would be much preferred if there was some kind of way for him to get a horse's corpse to use as reference, and that without having to buy and kill one. And it was quite hard to just ask someone where he could get a dead horse as well, after all, that would probably just scare people off. There had to be some way to get a horse's body, right? Maybe he could go out and hunt for a horse dot like monster in the forest. But maybe that wasn't such a good idea. It really seemed like for now, the best option was to simply ask someone if he could make a copy of their horse. Eisen walked over to the stable boy and asked him if he could take a horse there as a reference. But it obviously wouldn't be so easy. After all, who would just let a stranger pour mana into their horse? It would be a quite simple way to injure or kill it basically instantly, so the stable boy didn't want to take that risk. But he allowed Eisen to walk around and ask people tending to their horse if they were alright with it, so there was at least a little chance left. So, for the next hour, Eisen tried walking through the stable while trying to find someone that would let Eisen use mana copy on their horse. Most people felt either strongly conflicted or immediately rejected Eisen from the start, but after searching long enough, there was one young man that allowed Eisen to copy his horse. Eisen thanked him and looked at the horse with light brown fur. It was quite large, as even Eisen was only barely able to look over its back, and it seemed quite healthy, which was really only perfect in Eisen's opinion. He slowly placed his hand over the horse's back and poured his mana out of his palm, manipulating it so that it envelopes the horse completely, and then started to move it inside of the horse's body. Immediately, the horse reacted to the large amount of mana entering it and started to move around nervously, but the owner managed to make it calm down so that Eisen could continue his work. He focused on every part of the horse's body one by one, trying to copy it in as much detail as possible, until Mana Library expanded. Gigantuan steed, Eisen smiled happily and quickly pulled his mana back out of the horse's body, then once more thanked the young man for his help. After leaving the stable, Eisen and Bree quickly went to their room in the inn to see if Juk was still there or if he was out and about, doing something on his own. Once they saw that the room was completely empty, they decided to leave Juk to do his own thing already and then made their way to the place where Eisen might spend the next few days again, the smithy run by the Grandmaster Blacksmith Denmir, Dwarf's Delight. They walked through the front door and greeted the employee sitting at the counter while she was looking at Alu and Kuria in slight confusion, then made their way to the back of the shop, where Denmir was currently taking a break from his work. Ah. What are ye doing here, old man? And what's that what ye be broth there with ya? Don't tell me ye became some tamer all of a sudden. The dwarf yelled out and walked over to greet Aizen, his stare concentrated on both Kuria and Alu especially the latter. And once he got closer, as Eisen would have expected from him, Denmer's eyes became wide. Wait, that's no livin' be in, is it? Isn't that wolf's fur made of brass? Or does it just look like that? 
and it's just standin', there like a statue as well. He said with professional curiosity and squatted down onto the ground to take a closer look at the thing in front of him. Eisen scratched his beard lightly and chuckled. It's not a real wolf. It's an automaton, something like a mechanical golem. I gave it leather as skin and added fur out of brass as well. Hmm, why'd ye choose brass? Ah, wait a second. I can hear gears twisting inside, so that's how you made it. Makes sense to use brass then, it's good under high pressure. And ye used high dot tensile brass as well, as expected of you. What brings ye here then? I doubt ye just wanted to show me this magnificent creation. Denmir asked and looked at Aizen suspiciously. Yes, you're right with all of that. I came here to make another automaton. This time a horse, though. Immediately, Denmer's eyes shot open excitedly and he looked around to see if he had anything else to work on for the day. Is there any way I can help you? Eisen laughed lowly and thought for a bit. It would definitely be quite a lot of help to have someone of Denmer's skill level assist in the creation of the automaton, and it would most likely cut the time he needed down immensely as well. Actually, yes. You see, what I'm planning is to create a brass skeleton and fill it with different gears and tubes, as well as lubricant tanks. But creating all of these parts in themselves is quite a lot of work. It would be an amazing help if you could take the task of creating the skeleton while I'm working on the gears. Don't worry, I have something you can use as reference. Eisen explained, and Denmir listened eagerly before bursting out into laughter. All right, I'll help you however I can. We don't have a much high dot tensile brass left, so I'll get everyone here that doesn't have to work on something else make as many ingots as they can. Now, show me that reference. Denmir exclaimed with excitement deep in his voice, and Aizen couldn't help but smile himself as well. He poured out some of his mana and activated his mana copy skill to create the copy of only the horse's bones. Oh ho, Yiri quite skillful with mana as well, huh? Anyway, this ain't a normal horse, now is it? This is something, called a giganto dot something dot or dot another. Denmir muttered out, and Aizen nodded with a chuckle. Yes, it's called a gigantuan steed. Either way, that doesn't change too much, right? It just means that the parts have to be a bit bigger than if we created an automaton based on a regular horse. Huh, true that. Let's get started, then. Denmir exclaimed happily and Aizen nodded, grabbing his blacksmithing outfit out of Bree's backpack before going to change in another room. After that, he grabbed his tools as well and began to get to work on all the gears that he needed with some brass that Denmir handed him before he yelled at the other smiths to start working on making more of the high dot tensile brass that they needed. But before he worked, though, he of course also activated his crafting space. This work of mass dot producing the base metal parts of the horse automaton with the help of Denmir not only took up the rest of the day on which they started, but also most of the next day. Now it was afternoon of the second day of the creation process of the automaton, and it was about time to start assembling the whole thing. Thanks for your help until now, Denmir. I really owe you one. Aizen said with a smile, and Denmir shook his head with a grin. Don't cha worry about it, Yuri fine. I'm just excited to see the finished product. And as long as ye finish here, that definitely won't be a problem. The dwarf laughed loudly while eagerly waiting for the next step of what Aizen would do. And to his surprise, he didn't start assembling the body, but instead took out different glass flasks and tubes, as well as a few crystals and some green gems. After sitting down at a work table by the wall, Aizen set all of these things up and was immediately surrounded by most of the smiths that worked in the smithy that day, since every single one of them was incredibly interested in what Aizen was making. With a sigh, Aizen turned his crafting space into the one for alchemy and began to smile, then placed the rank 4 mana crystal that he bought, so that this core would at least be on par with the one that he made for Alu, into the mithril mortar and began to grind it down until it was a fine powder, then did the same with the mind and soul crystals before mixing them into the mana crystal powder. After he poured the water he needed into it and carefully stirred everything, 
Eisen poured the mixture into the flask that he then connected to the distillation system, slowly boiling said water away again. This left a crystal structure on the bottom of the beacon that Eisen quickly removed with transmutation and then formed into a sphere, before disassembling the distillation system since he didn't need it anymore, saving the leftover water in a small glass bottle. Next, Eisen grabbed the golem core and some of the beast crystals that he managed to buy, albeit at quite a high price, and then began to create the same kind of runic symbols on its surface as when he created Alu's golem core. After that was done, Eisen grabbed three enchantment marbles, changed his crafting space to enchanting as well, and then enchanted the golem.core base with the three enchantments that were needed to finish it. And just like before, Eisen managed to break through both alchemy and enchanting, giving him bonus stats again. Just like the last time, with Alu's core, Eisen created the copy of the horse's heart that he made, and placed it over the golem core, using transmutation to form it into a heart. But that wasn't all that Eisen made with transmutation and enchanting. While switching around between the alchemy and enchanting crafting spaces, Eisen created three different sensory organs for the horse. Eyes, nose and ears, all properly enchanted. On top of that, Eisen also created a mana crystal brain for the automaton so that it would be able to process and remember information just like Alu. And now that all of the base parts of the automaton were there, it was time for Eisen to assemble it. Chapter 76 Mechanical Horse You are listening at NovelFull.audio Eisen squatted down onto the ground in front of the automaton parts and continued using his alchemy crafting space. However, before he even started assembling the metal steed, a notification popped up that Eisen was incredibly happy, but at the same time confused with. Crafting space reached level 100 and rank 1, upgrading to rank 2, complete control over tools within the skill area, due to ranking. Up your crafting space skill, you gained plus 1 STR and plus 1 END. After reading through the skill notification, Eisen began to scratch his beard to figure out what that effect meant. What kind of control was it talking about? Exactly while asking himself that question, the hammer lying next to him began to emit a very light pulsating glow, which only Eisen seemed to be able to see, as nobody else reacted to it. He concentrated on the hammer, and tried to control it in the only way that he could imagine could be meant, telekinetically. The hammer slowly began floating upward and toward Eisen's hand while he imagined holding it, and the tool positioned itself perfectly within his hand. Of course, the smiths around him were extremely surprised and confused at this, but Eisen couldn't stop grinning. He may be able to already do this kind of thing by summoning his mana doubles, but this felt quite different. Eisen was controlling the tool itself, rather than the being holding it. It didn't seem like he would be able to build up the force actually needed Smith something with the hammer like this, but at least it was quite useful to be able to nearly instantly get whatever tool he needed. Anyway, for now, he didn't need his hammer, so he simply laid it back onto the ground before grabbing the first bones and starting to build the legs of the mechanical horse first, then the torso, and then at last the head. Just like with Alu, he used brass joints to make sure every part of the horse's body could move properly, and once he had all the large parts, Eisen simply attached the limbs and head to the torso. Once that was done, Eisen got to work placing the gears and tubes inside. First, though, Eisen affixed the heart-shaped golem core to the brass spine, then began to build the automaton's innards up from the core. While he was doing so, even the smiths that were working on other things before joined in and began watching Eisen closely, helping him by holding the brass horse up so that Eisen could reach every spot without worry, placing all of the mana crystal organs into the head as well. After another few hours, it was closely approaching evening and Eisen wanted to start, and maybe even finish, adding all of the muscles that he could. Considering how close he was to finishing this automaton, Eisen really didn't want to stop until he was done, so even if it took him until the middle of the night, he wanted to complete this project. But before he continued, Eisen turned to Bree while taking a short break. Hey, Bree, would you mind going over to Jekyll's and grabbing me some leather? I'll give you the money, so don't worry about that. Emichem. Of course. Bree said happily and took the money that Eisen handed her, then looked back up at him. What kind of leather should I bring? 
anything strong, but flexible. And it should preferably include a large piece big enough to cover the whole torso. Okay. I'll be back soon. Bree exclaimed and practically sprinted out of the smithy. Don't let Jekyll scam you. Eisen yelled after her, but Bree seemed to already be too far away. So, now that that was being taken care of, Eisen walked over to the spinning wheel and the mountain of mana crystals that he grabbed out of Bree's backpack, making sure to just so slightly soften them before turning them into thread one by one. Seeing how this process took up an hour on its own, Eisen wanted to hurry up and start giving the horse automaton its muscles. String by string, Eisen attached the mana crystal muscles to the different parts of the mechanical body, and while he was doing so, Bree returned with the leather that Eisen needed to give the automaton skin. The rest of the night was filled with the quite monotonous work of Eisen attaching the strings to the metal base, as well as sewing the leather onto its outside. Nonetheless, every single one of the smiths, as well as Bree and Korea, were watching closely and full of interest. It was only when it was around midnight, actually the longest that Eisen has stayed up within the game so far, that people began to talk to each other about the soon dot to dot be finished product, and the small crowd became rowdier the closer Eisen came to completion. Especially while Eisen was moving the brass ingots over the leather surface to create the brass fur with the help of transmutation and mana copy. After all, these smiths didn't usually get to see such a scene, not even from the grandmaster blacksmith that they decided to work under. The subtle movements of Eisen's hand that seemed like they could change the shape of everything they touched, and the speed that only got faster the longer that this old man worked and the more he concentrated on his task. Not to mention the pure skill that he showed simply by grabbing his tools, as if they were merging together into a single being. All of this was something that the smiths learned from, and even Denmir couldn't help but watch in awe, although he still kept thinking back onto whenever he saw Eisen swing his hammer at the glowing hot metal in front of him. Such beauty was the reason that he chose to take up the craft, and from the first moment that he saw such skillful handling of metals, the dwarf simply became obsessed. He practiced with whatever scraps that he could find until he was old enough to start an apprenticeship with the local blacksmith, spending day after day simply working in the scorching heat of the smithy to perfect his craft. With every single completed item, he came closer toward the goal that he was still working toward to this day. The goal of being the same as that man he saw when he was merely five years old. This scene was deeply embedded in Denmer's mind as if it happened only a few minutes ago. That man was borrowing space in the local smithy, that was still much, much smaller than Denmer's is now, and crowds of craftsmen came rushing in from all over to town to witness him work. Young Denmir squeezed through the mass of people until he stood before him, the man that he was looking up to forever. With only simple steel, he created a masterpiece capable of slaying the strongest of beasts with a single scratch, but then smelted it back down with four simple words that he muttered to himself. These words were those that Denmir kept telling himself every day like a mantra, and that helped him grow more motivated simply by hearing them. Most people seem to have missed what that man said, but Denmir heard it as clear as if he himself said it. I can do better. These four simple words, that some might see as cynical or self-deprecating, were taken by Denmir in a different way. I haven't reached my full potential yet. And the similarities between that man's movements and Eisen's were far, far too great to not be reminded of that scene. It was as if. They were the same person. Gigantuan steed automaton, golem, quality. Perfect, rank. 3, dp. 3000, mp. 10, str. 100, agi. 60, int. 10, wis. 1, description. A special type of golem called an automaton created by the Omni Crafts Master Eisen. Its main structure is made completely of brass, and has different mana crystal constructs supporting it and giving it multiple bonus functions. The golem core has been enhanced with runes made of a beast gem, giving a bonus to the beast dot like body, and allowing it to move more beast. Like. This is also supported through the complex recreation of a gigantuan steed's heart. The mana, crystal muscles allow it to be stronger and more agile. 
The brain synchronizes with the fake dot soul of the Golan core and allows the automaton to have a growing wisdom stat, since it can now store knowledge. This knowledge is collected through the mana crystal eyes, nose, ears, and tongue. The wisdom stat will start of low, but can grow over time. The agility stat will lose or gain effectiveness depending on the amount and quality of the lubricants passing through the automaton's body. For creating something of overwhelming quality with the use of 5 skills, you gain plus 2 to STR, END, INT, and WS, as well as plus 1 to AGI, you have reached the maximum of stat bonuses available through breaking through the skills tailoring and leatherworking. It is easier to break through these skills, but you will cease to gain bonus stats through this action. These were the notifications that Aizen saw when he finally poured his mana into the automaton's body to activate it. Just like before with Alu, the gears and joints started creaking as they started to move for the first time while the brass fur stood on end like small needles, but soon enough flatted down again. The giant, dwarf halfling that just created this magnificent creature moved his palm over the brass fur and looked the gigantuan horse golem over to make sure everything was working properly. Intensely, the numerous smiths were staring at Aizen and the automaton, waiting for something to happen. And to not let them wait any longer, Aizen looked at the mechanical horse and gave it its first command. Follow me. At the same time, Aizen walked a few steps away, prompting the automaton to turn around and make its first steps. The moment that its first hoof touched the stone floor underneath them again in a light clicking sound, the smiths began to cheer and celebrate the first movements of this automaton. They walked over to Aizen and congratulated him on such an amazing build, before finally making their way to their respective homes now that it was about 3 a.m. This left only Aizen, Bree and Denmir, as well as Korea and the two automatons, in the smithy. And just before they wanted to make their way out as well, Denmir stopped Aizen. Is everything all right? Aizen asked the dwarf, but he simply stayed silent for a few seconds before looking at Aizen with a deep frown. Aizen, do you know about the five that peaked? He suddenly asked, and full of confusion, Aizen shook his head. No, sorry. Who are they? Denmir sighed and nodded. Thought so. Listen, air. The five are those that reached the maximum level possible. They reached absolute immortality. No matter how often they die, they always come back. One of the five is a master of combat, who showed the world that we can fight back against monsters. Another has complete control over magic, and she showed the world the heights that magic can go. Then there is a woman that is so skilled in the arts that she can create masterpieces within minutes, and who can fell a whole kingdom with a single note of her voice. As for the fourth, he can toy with life in whatever ways he wants. He can make forests grow with a single snap, or raise a whole army from the dead with a yawn. And at last, there is a master of all crafts, that can turn even a pebble into the deadliest weapon ever seen, or create an impenetrable fortress out of air. Aizen's eyes immediately widened at those descriptions. Either this was the greatest coincidence ever that none of the developers noticed, or... Aizen. I think Yuri that master of all crafts. Aizen, race. Giant, dwarf halfling, occupation. Omni Crafts Master, Level 71, HP 1865, MP 1898, STR 105, End 105, AGI 103, Int 107, Wis 108, Cha 11, Titles, Casanova, Champion, Original of the Mechanical Arts Limit Breaker V, Skills, A Dwarf's Hands, Rank. 2, Level. 96, A Giant Strength, Rank. 2, Level. 75, Alchemy, Rank. 2, Level. 49, Blacksmithing, Rank. 2, Level. 56, Cooking, Rank. 0, Level. 68, Crafting Space, Rank. 2, Level. 2, Dismembering, Rank. 
0, level. 1, drawing, rank. 1, level. 6, enchanting, rank. 2, level. 12, flame of the earth magic, rank. 1, level. 51, golmancy, rank. 0, level. 68, leatherworking, rank. 2, level. 16, lockpicking, rank. 0, level. 1, mana copy, rank. 1, level. 26, mana double, rank. 2, level. 46, mana manipulation, rank. 2, level. 41, swordsmanship, rank. 2, level. 75, tailoring, rank. 2, level. 45, taming, rank. 1, level. 68, tool connection, rank. 1, level. 89, truth seeing eye, rank. 0, level. 35, woodworking, rank. 0, level. 49. Chapter 77 The 5 that piqued you are listening at novelfull.audio. Eisen stared at Denmir in confusion. How could he be one of those five? And it seemed like not only Eisen was thinking that, since also Bree was completely surprised at this idea. O point one of the five. B dot but, H dot how could he? How would someone even steal the experience of someone with stats as high as those of one of the five? She muttered out, thinking back onto the time she kept watching Aizen's immense skill. The more she thought about it, the more this idea made sense. Stealing someone's experience was such an incredibly hard process that many thought of it to be some kind of urban legend that parents used to scare their child into studying diligently and not taking things for granted. But obviously, it was a real thing, seeing how Aizen did lose his experience. So Aizen needed to be a great person to be worth getting his experience stolen. There was just one more question that needed to be asked. And what would you do with that much experience? Bree asked, still trying to grasp the possibility of Aizen really being such a legendary person. Aizen sighed loudly and scratched his beard. Denmir, do you really think so? I, I do. It makes sense, right? Usually, you wouldn't be able to do anything, but blabber like a baby without any experience, but Yiri not only talking like Yivi got millennia worth of life experience, Yiri also crafting like it. The dwarf explained, and Aizen nodded lightly. It was quite obvious that the developers meant for him and the other originals to be, the five that peaked, so there was no reason to pretend as if it wasn't the case. I see, and let's say that's really true, I do wonder the same thing as Bree. What would you do with that much experience? Aizen asked Denmir, who crossed his arms and thought for a bit, before his eyes shot open. Don't tell me. So that's what that was. There are rumors going around lately. All over the world, there are people appearing out of nowhere. Literally, out of nowhere. Just in the middle of a smaller town, light congeals up and a person appears. They seem to know much, much more than they let on. They're supposed to be quite harmless, most of them are trying to get into commerce for some reason. These people suddenly started appearing yesterday morning. From the description of these events, Aizen knew that Denmir was talking about the appearance of other players. The timing was right, and since they were employees of the largest investors, it made sense for them to work toward being merchants. And in what way do you think my experience being stolen connects to these people? Aizen asked, and Denmir stated his theory. I think that someone, or something, is using, your experience to create new people. I know it might sound crazy, but it's the only explanation I can come up with. That's possible. Aizen asked in surprise, in response to which the dwarf in front of him simply shrugged. Maybe. How I said, it's just a theory. Nobody really knows what experience is and what it can do. Of course there is the tangible actual experience you gain by simply living and doing things, but the experience that makes us level up is different. 
All we know is that it is deeply embedded in our soul and body, letting us grow in strength or speed just by leveling up. Since it can do that and basically change what our body is like nearly instantly, why couldn't it create new people? Aizen nodded as he listened to Denmir, slowly building up the background story from a player's perspective. Seeing that Aizen was simply scratching his beard and listening with his eyes closed, Denmir couldn't help but sigh loudly with a soft laugh. I'm over, air telling ya that you're a literal legend and are close to being a god walking amongst people, and ye re just talking this, well, like this. Aizen began to chuckle lowly before shrugging. Basically, yes. I mean, how would you react if someone told you who you are supposed to be? And we don't have any definite proof for this anyway, so it would be silly if I got excited. That's true, haha. Huh? Denmir laughed and nodded while his heart was beating like he never felt before. Aizen may be saying that there is no definite proof, but to Denmir, there was no other possibility. In his mind, it was absolute definite that Aizen was one of the five. And such a thought, that the person that Denmir has looked up to for his whole life, the one that founded this town he grew up in and basically led the dwarven race toward what it is today, was now directly in front of him and even learned the blacksmithing skill from him, made Denmir feel no doubt about it. But no matter how much he wanted to, Denmir couldn't just freak out about it now like Bree. After all, he was a grown man. And he didn't want to embarrass himself in front of his hero, obviously. But now it was quite late, and everyone was starting to feel tired, even Bree who didn't usually need much sleep was rubbing her eyes and yawning loudly. And as such, everyone decided to make their way back to their respective sleeping places now. They could continue this talk some other time if they wanted to, although there wasn't too much more to talk about with the extent of the knowledge that they had. So, Aizen led his two automata back to the inn with Kuria on his shoulder and Bree following closely behind. The horse automaton's body was actually so large that it was hard for it to fit through the doors of the inn, but in the end it managed to do so without breaking anything. Ah, good morning, Aizen. Juk exclaimed with a smile on his face, seeing that he could now talk to the old man for the first time in a few days now. It seemed like the monkey beast person didn't have work that day, so he could be online as much as he wanted to. He especially wanted to talk about that new creature, or rather structure, inside of their room. That huge golden horse standing in the corner. Since it seemed to act in a similar fashion to the wolf automaton that Aizen made, Juk figured that this was also an automaton. Aizen stood up from his bed and looked around the room, noticing that he and Juk were alone, with Bree apparently having left already. Good morning Juk. This is actually a good chance. I need to tell you something. With that, Aizen began to tell Juk about all of the things that Denmir mentioned to him, about the sudden appearance of people all over the world, as well as the legends of the five that peaked. Of course he was also interested in the backstory to describe the appearance of players in the world, but Juk was thinking more about the part about him saying, he could raise armies from the dead. There was only one thing that he could think of with that. Erm, Aizen, do you maybe have any bones I could have? He asked, and Aizen nodded with a frown. Ichem. Yeah, I do. I still have the bones I used as a reference when building Alu. Why do you ask? I wanted to try something with them. Do you know about necromancy? Juk asked while Aizen was grabbing the wolf dot bones out of the backpack that Bree left in their room. The old man stopped for a second to think, but then shook his head. I'm not sure I do. But necro means, dead, right. So I'm guessing it's death dot magic. Exactly. It's what you just mentioned, the one that could control life and death so greatly has to be me, right. Then necromancy should definitely be a thing here as well. Juk said excitedly while placing the bones into a small pile on the ground, trying to think about what to do next. Interested in what would happen now, Aizen squatted down next to him and watched as Juk seemed to pour his mana out of his hands and into the bones. For a while, nothing happened, but then the bones started shaking a little bit and shifted around. 
Juk seemed to be concentrating strongly on what he was doing, so Aizen made an effort not to do anything that could disturb him, simply looking at the scene quietly. After a few minutes, a completed wolf skeleton was standing in front of Aizen and Juk, although Juk currently seemed to have to constantly supply it with some mana to have it keep up its shape. But soon enough, Juk's concentration slipped and the bones fell back onto the ground nearly immediately. And the reason why his concentration slipped was quite simple, he got the notification that he learned the necromancy skill and was quite excited about it. But Aizen couldn't help but ask. And what can you do with that now? It won't be too useful in combat if you have to constantly supply it with mana, right? I could make something like a mana crystal harness that can supply it with some if you want. Juk looked at the bones for a few seconds, before shaking his head lightly. No, thank you. I know that I won't be able to do anything with it now, but most skills are basically useless at rank zero, right? If I rank them up enough, I should be able to use them quite well. Besides that, these animated skeletons seem to be like... Berm. What's the word? I just had it, air. Bunraku, you know. Juk asked somewhat embarrassed, scratching the back of his head lightly. He was quite impressive, though. Aizen only noticed that Juk somewhat messed up in English two times. First, when he had trouble pronouncing monkey correctly during his self.introduction, and just now. Although forgetting a word in a foreign language can hardly be seen as messing up. Aizen chuckled and nodded. I think I know what you mean. Puppets, right. Juk's eyes lit up and he smiled, nodding happily. Yes, that's the word. Puppets. Right. I should have known that though. Anyway, erm, um, they are like puppets. If you made something that supplied them with mana, I would have the body, but would still miss the strings to control it. Ah, uh, I see. That makes sense, yeah. Well, tell me if you want me to make something for you, anyway. I'll be spending a while making a carriage now, so look for me at the woodworkers if you need me. That reminds me, what have you been doing the past few days? Aizen asked Juk, who happily placed his arms onto his hips. At moments like these, you could notice that the monkey beast person has lost some of his initial awkwardness around Aizen, which honestly made him Tsutia happy to see. Juk smiled and told Aizen, there's a dungeon around here. I spent the past few days trying to clear that. The first few levels aren't hard, but soon enough the monsters caught up with my level, and I managed to come close to level 100. I think I'll be there soon enough. Wow, quite impressive. I wonder if there will be something interesting once you reach that level. Make sure to tell me if there is. Aizen laughed and lightly pat Juk's back before telling his automata to stand up, as well as waking Kuria up who was sleeping on the large back of the horse automaton. It was now time to start building that carriage. Chapter 78 Working with Would You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. After meeting back up with Bree at the inn's restaurant, the group ate some breakfast before Aizen, Bree, Kuria and the two automata made their way toward the woodworker of the town after splitting up with Juk to see if Aizen would be able to buy some good wood to use for his carriage, while at the same time maybe borrowing space to actually construct it somewhere. Once he stepped into the workshop after explaining the situation to the owner, he looked around and saw numerous people working on all kinds of things. Some were making shelves, others tables, and then others were making simple decorative wooden statues. The owner, who was actually quite happy to host a greatly talented craftsman like Aizen, led him to an unused room in the back with a large door leading directly outside toward the street, making the whole room look kind of like a garage. Thanks for letting me use this place. Aizen said to the owner with a smile on his face, and the, apparently, human woodworker laughed lightly. No no, it's fine. We haven't been using this place for quite a while anyway. And I'm pretty sure you're welcome at any craftsman's workshop in Melro by now. Ah, let me show you our wood storage. You can go ahead and just take whatever you like, as long as there's no red art dot marking on it. That just stands for it being reserved for something else. If you're worried about the wood's price, 
just ask anyone in here about it. They should know. The owner explained and quickly led Aizen to a large room filled with a multitude of different wood. Just ignoring the whole types of wood there were in the first places, some of it was lying there in planks in different thicknesses and lengths, or even in the form of whole logs, some that were stripped of the bark, while others still had it on them. Eisen thanked the owner, who then made his way back into the actual workshop to continue what he was working on, while Eisen started looking around in the storage. He took small planks into his hands to see their strength and flexibility in order to choose which to use. In the end, he chose a type of wood that seemed quite similar to a variant of white oak, a type of wood that's quite well suited for use outside and was even used in the construction of boats sometimes, so it would be perfect for a carriage. First, Eisen brought what he would need for the wheels into the room he would be able to construct his carriage in and grabbed some tools to get to work. What he would first need to make were the center dot parts of the wheels, the hub. These were cylindrical objects that would be used as the base to construct the wheels from the center outward. So, Eisen placed a thick and relatively short part of a log into the lathe that was standing by the wall, stepping onto the small pedal at the bottom to test out the spinning dot speed, before preparing to start carving the soon dot to dot be hub into the shape he needed. For that, he used tool connection on the sharp wood chisel and activated his crafting space, laying all the different tools he would need down on the table next to him for easy access. While the piece of the log started to quickly turn, Eisen set the tip of a large gouge chisel onto the wood to first get it into the right base shape to work with it more easily. After that was done, he used different chisels to more easily get some definition into the wood and make sure it was nice that looking and pleasing to the eye. Once the base for the hub was completed, Eisen grabbed it out of the lathe and began to carve out the openings where the spokes would be placed into, making sure these openings were the same distance away from each other all the way around. Then, he also added an opening on the side where the axle would be put into. Eisen repeated this three more times to create the hubs of the other wheels as well, before starting to finish them all off by first washing the surface with some water and then smoothing it down with different grits of sandpaper, at last adding a finishing solution to the wood to make sure it would be protected from the elements even further. He wasn't entirely sure what was inside of it, since he didn't recognize any of the material names used in its production when the owner of the workshop showed it to him, but Eisen looked at how it affected the wood treated with it beforehand and was quite impressed with it, so he chose to use it as well, especially since it seemed to be especially compatible with wood that would be standing outside in different weathers. Soon after finishing off the last of the four hubs, Eisen finally got the notification that his woodworking skill ranked up. The only rank dot up effect that he got through this was that it would be easier to work with wood now, so it was a nice little extra that would help Eisen while he was working. Next, Eisen grabbed some nice square planks and set them into the lathe as well to make the spokes, once more starting out with a gouge chisel to give it the rough shape it needed and then detailing it with other, smaller chisels, making sure to get the right shape for the parts that would be used to connect it with the hub as well as the surface on the outside. Once Eisen created the bases for all the spokes, he once more finished them in the same way that he finished the hubs, first cleaning, then sanding, and at last treating them with the solution he bought from this workshop. After laying them to the side to let them dry properly and make sure the solution was properly pulled into the wood, Eisen began working on the outside ring, which he would create by making three different pieces which he could then later push together to complete the circle. But since he couldn't use the lathe for this, Eisen instead simply carved everything by hand without the help of such a tool. Of course it took longer than making the other parts, but that was to be expected. Eisen finished those parts and then let them dry together with the others, before starting with the rest of the base for the carriage. First, he would make a simple axle, in this case just a simple wooden rod, and then something like a long box to put around it to ensure nothing could get stuck around the axle while the carriage was moving. The wheels and axle in the back would be stationary, while the front would be attached to something that would let it move. Eisen carved the two rods first, finished them off, and then created the boxes for them as well. Since the parts needed to dry first, Eisen continued making the parts for the base before assembling it. Usually, it might take a while until the wood fully absorbed the solution, but in this game, 
processes like that were usually sped up quite a bit, so it wouldn't take too long until he could start putting everything together. After finishing the boxes, Eisen created a sort of spine that would be used to connect the front and back axles. It really was only a simple plank that Eisen carved in order to make it fit into a slot in the boxes properly. At the front of that connective plank, where the front axle would be added to, Eisen carved the wood so that would let him insert a central piece of the front axle in a way that would let it turn. The finished carriage would have a wooden rod at the lower front to which the horse automaton would then be connected in order to pull the carriage. That part would be connected to the front axle itself so that it would properly follow the horse's movements. Again, this wasn't really that complicated to make, as Eisen only needed the simple wooden rod as well as three connector pieces for that, which were quite easily carved. On the other hand, this was all the type of work that took up a lot of time, even if it was quite easy. Eisen already entered early afternoon, despite only having finished the most rudimentary base for the carriage, without even preparing anything to be able to create the actual structure that would be the carriage's body. And although that was the case, Eisen didn't mind working on one thing for a long time. He actually liked the change of pace that it brought, which is also why he enjoyed making his automata so much. The feeling of satisfaction you would experience when finishing something you worked on for days or even weeks was incomparably greater than finishing something within a few hours. Overall, this game was an incredible treasure to him. With his 70 years of life experience, he never would have thought to be able to learn whole new crafts again that would open up completely different ways to make things. Just thinking about what kind of enchantment you could put on different items to see what would happen made Eisen feel like a child on Christmas morning nearly every single time. And he absolutely adored that feeling. It didn't matter which craft it was, blacksmithing, tailoring, or woodworking, Eisen managed to grow to these heights due to his pursuit of new things he could make in order to feel that special satisfaction. And now, he was making something that would allow him to continue that exact pursuit in a whole new world. Thinking about everything like that, Eisen only sped up even more compared to before, when he was already working at an incredible speed. He actually managed to finish this part of his work earlier than he planned in his mind, so he allowed himself to take a quick break. Eisen looked over to the side, where both Bree and Korea were watching quite curiously, although Korea especially seemed to be slowly getting bored of simply watching Eisen do the same thing over and over again, which made sense. After all, Korea was barely a week old, so nobody could expect her not to act like a young child. But at least Bree was still watching Eisen with awe, in a way that only grew stronger after the whole thing with Denmir talking about Eisen being one of the five that peaked. Since her already seemed to grow a slight bit weaker, Eisen decided to just wait it out, and talk to her about it only if it didn't stop. It was fine to look up to one of your friends, but this was basically just Bree putting Eisen on a huge pedestal that he didn't want to be on. He wanted them to be friends, not have her be his fan. Either way, if Korea was feeling bored, he should probably look for something that she could do. Maybe having her practice her magic would be a good idea. After thinking for a short while, Eisen looked over at the bag containing the different health and mana pills, until he got an idea. He still had a few amaran flowers left over that weren't really suitable to either hand in for the request at the guild, nor for using them to make potions. But maybe the seeds were still fine. BVEC so, Eisen walked over to Bree's backpack and got out a few of the leftover flowers, carefully removing the seeds from the flower head, cleaned them with some water, and then asked Bree to use a spell to dry them quickly. Then, he made a small wooden cup to use as a flower pot and filled it with soil from his flame of the earth element completely turned into earth, placing the seeds into that soil. All right Korea, how about you try to let these seeds sprout? Aizen smiled while looking at the small myconid on his palm. Chapter 79 Misunderstanding You are listening at NovelFull.audio Eisen set Korea down next to the small wooden flower dot pot that he made and placed a bowl filled with mana potions next to her so that she could continue practicing with her mana as much as possible. At first, she was quite confused, but then later figured out what her master wanted her to do. And Eisen wasn't entirely sure if this would work, but mana was such an amazing thing that it couldn't hurt to try, right? 
Anyway, Aizen continued his short break and then decided to continue not too long afterward. Now, he would start preparing the carriage's frame. He had some ideas for it already, so he would immediately start with that. First, Aizen carved a part of a log into a really thick pole, large and sturdy enough to easy carry the roof as one of the six main base pillars. Once he had that base, he grabbed some of the more art.oriented carving tools and started carving different shapes out of the wood, to make it look slightly like tools and materials, such as hammers or things like rolls of string, were simply stacked on top of each other. He didn't want to make it look too overwhelming, so he carved these things in a way that they wouldn't be too deep in, and you would only really notice it if you actually looked at the pillar. It should look like a regular pillar most of the time, but at second glance you should be able to see that it belonged to the original of mechanical arts. Aizen just felt like it should have such a style. Anyway, Aizen made sure to carve an edge in a 90 degree angle onto the pillar so that it would be easy to attach different planks to it on the inside. He repeated this four more times, not five, since he only needed to split one of them in half vertically to create the two pillars that would be placed in the center parts of the sides. Once Aizen carved what he wanted into those pillars of wood, he cleaned and sanded everything before applying the same solution as before onto them, setting them aside to let them dry. For most of the rest of the carriage, he could simply use the planks that were already provided, so he would be able to take a break from preparing the materials for now. It would just be a waste of time if he insisted on making literally every single part of it himself. But due to the size of the pillars, it already took him until early evening to finish his preparations, which also meant that the wheels could now be assembled. And then tomorrow, he would make whatever he needed to use as connectors between all parts, as well as the outer metal rings for the wheels, at Denmer's smithy and bring it back there, meaning that he would be able to assemble the carriage. Then all that was left to do was to make some containers to keep things in for the inside, such as different barrels and crates, as well as create a work table with enough space to do small crafts on like carving small statues, experimenting with enchantments, or simply to come up with different ideas for future items. But for now, Aizen grabbed all the pieces that he would need for a wheel and began punching the spokes into the holes that Aizen made for them, by placing a small piece of wood at the end and hitting that with a mallet to make sure they would properly move inside as far as possible. After that was done, Aizen did basically the same when he added the wooden outer ring, hitting it with a mullet to push it onto the spokes and into the other parts of the ring that were added beforehand. This on its own didn't really take that long, and after making sure that each wheel was properly put together, he decided to simply go to the storage and see to grabbing all of the wood that he would need in the form of different planks, and then quickly paid for it. It was somewhat expensive, but Aizen wasn't surprised considering the quality of the wood. For the next few hours, Aizen didn't do anything but saw all the different planks into the right lengths and placed them down in a way that would make it relatively easy for him to remember what was supposed to go where, before he, Bree, Kuria and the automata prepared to make their way back to the inn. But first, Aizen looked at the horse automaton with a slight frown. What should I name you? He muttered to himself, thinking about possible names. He could go with the same kind of theme as with Alu, so that would be Ok. Nope, that does not sound good. Then how about not using Equus, but rather Cabalus? Alright, got it. Cabarum. Aizen said out loud and nodded in satisfaction. That was when he noticed something interesting. Alu, now that she was a few days old, started to act different to a regular golem. It seemed like the beast gem and the mana crystal brain finally took effect, and instead of simply standing around like a statue, Alu was kind of slightly swaying left and right just a tiny bit, and even moved her head toward Aizen when he began talking. And to Aizen, that simply seemed baffling. This was basically just a machine made out of gears and tubes, but because of those mana crystals, it was actually able to learn and change over time. So, being more than just happy about that, Aizen kneeled down and pet her back with a smile, moving his hands through her brass fur, feeling the soft vibrations caused by the gears moving inside of her. And while he was doing that and happily talking to her in, well, the way you talk to your pet, Something else changed and she suddenly began leaning into Aizen's hand, as if she was enjoying the feeling of being petted. Obviously, 
This made Aizen even happier, and he kept playing around with both Alu and Kabaram for a little while to see if he could increase their intelligence and wisdom even more. And to his surprise, he really did. Kabaram now also started slightly swaying while he was standing like a regular living creature. After this, Aizen walked back over to the table where he had Kuria practice her magic, and saw her napping while laying down against the small wooden flower pot. It seemed like she wasn't able to really make anything grow at first glance, but once he took a closer look and burrowed a slight bit through the soil he made with his magic element, he saw that one of the seeds actually began sprouting some roots, meaning that Kuria really managed to do it. The old man excitedly opened her status to see what had changed. Korea, race. Myconid child, Ammonita muscaria, owner. Eisen, rank. 1, level. 19, HP. 150, MP. 560, STR. 6, end. 8, AGI. 8, int. 34, Wiss. 37, Skills, Mana Manipulation, Rank. 1, Level. 16, Plant Control, Rank. 0, Level. 3, O. Oh. Good job, Lil, Girl. You're really growing up to be a real little dryad. But Plant Control, huh? If she got that skill, then it should be easier for her to do all of that stuff from now on. Aizen said with a smile on his face and placed Korea into one of the pocket on his crafting outfit while gathering up all the stuff that he didn't want to leave somewhere like this overnight, meaning basically everything beside the materials for the carriage. Once they had everything, Aizen, his creatures, and Bree made their way out of the woodworker's workshop and back toward the inn, where they had dinner together and then went to bed. Dad. Are you okay? Are you still playing that stupid game? Melody, Benjamin's one and only daughter, practically yelled over the phone the instant that he answered the call. After letting out a silent sigh paired with him shaking his head, Benjamin finally responded. Hello, Melody. Good morning to you too, honey. And yes, I'm still playing that game, but please don't call it stupid. It's actually really amazing. But it's just some random game, right? You've been doing nothing else but play that for more than a week. While quite obviously just being concerned for her father, Melody did what she basically always did when it came to other people's decisions. Benjamin knew that she meant well, but if someone did something she didn't agree with, she told them immediately. And she wouldn't back down either. So, in Benjamin's experience, it would be best to just try and change the topic. Yes, I have been playing that non-dot-stop. I can show you why I think it's so amazing when everyone comes here, don't worry. I think you'll understand then. Anyway, how is Sophia doing? I haven't talked to her in a while. Benjamin asked while starting to make himself something for breakfast, noticing that he was actually kind of running low on food. He looked at the clock hanging on the kitchen wall, and thought about how long it would take him to go to the store and be back with enough time left to finish the carriage within one in dot game day. Luckily, he lived in a small town, and the nearest grocery store was usually quite empty around this time. He could just go to the closest Wawa as well to see if he could pick something small up to eat for lunch. Sophia is doing pretty well for herself. And I actually think she secretly has a boyfriend. Melody exclaimed excitedly, and in response, Benjamin nearly choked on the cup of water he was just drinking. W. What, a boyfriend? He asked, utterly confused, but trying not to show that in his voice. Although apparently, Melody could see through her father. What's that reaction about? Sophia is super cute, right? I'm more surprised she didn't have any boyfriends yet. Why? Yeah, of course she is. We should have her introduce us to him sometime, then. Benjamin muttered out, trying to play along, but feeling completely unsure what to do. There was something about Sophia that only Benjamin Sr. and Benjamin Jr., Benjamin and his grandson Benji, knew about. And because of that, he knew that Sophia couldn't have a boyfriend. Sophia had a girlfriend. She was gay, 
and simply didn't have her coming out yet. The guy that Melody thought she was dating was most likely just a simple boy dot friend, not a boyfriend. Definitely. Maybe I can ask her to bring him to the family reunion. Yeah, I'll do that. Melody exclaimed happily, obviously excited at the idea. And before Benjamin could tune in to shut her down in a way that wouldn't expose Sophia's sexuality, Melody already continued talking. I'll ask her right now. I think you should be excited, you'll probably be a great grandpa soon. Talk to you later, love you dad. Wait, Mello. And she hung up. Great. I should probably call Tony to talk to Benji for a bit then. Benjamin sighed loudly and started eating his breakfast while dialing Tony's phone number.